Hey, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, our new Monroe podcast system. Um, we're here with uh, Darren Palmer. Darren is the uh, present uh, uh, vice president of uh, global EV programs with Ford Motor Company. And um, uh, Darren, I'd just like to welcome you. And maybe you could give us a little background on, uh, you know, how you got here and stuff like that. That would be uh, kind of cool, I think, for everybody to know. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, so um, I was the product development uh, director for the first generation of our vehicles, working on, in Team Edison with an amazing team. Um, and so that was the Mustang mach -E and the Lightning and the uh, E-Transit. And then I moved into a role where I was, we were launching the vehicles because we were learning so much there. So we uh, moved into the general manager role for a, a year while we launched them. And now I've moved back to product development where we're leading our next generation of electric vehicles. Hmm, very good. So it sounds like it's kind of an exciting time, but I, I think you, uh, you, uh, you had uh, a little background as well uh, when you were uh, in Europe. Can you give us a, a bit of uh, information on that as well? So, yeah, so uh, a lot of my career was uh, with Ford in Europe and uh, sometimes in the UK, sometimes in Germany. And I, I had uh, small cars for quite a while, and that was all over the world. In fact, we had product development centers on four continents and uh, manufacturing sites on five continents. So that was interesting, and small cars are extremely challenging uh, to work on. So th that was part of it. And then uh, at some point in career, I went across to quality. I just launched a few vehicles and mainly had been in engineering and leading uh, car programs. But I thought, hey, I'd like. To, I think I can do something new there. I think I can make a, a difference. And I went to quality, and it changed my life, actually, because it got me so close to customers. And really, I spent a lot of time with customers every day, and they're not shy about telling you what they like or don't <laughs> like about your product. Mm. And they uh, every day, and I noticed that if the product was um, unique and interesting to them, then they really were much more enthusiastic about it. So it changed my whole outlook from there to how can we be closer to customers and listen to them more easily. And I've got to say, in those days, it was more about the hardware, the physicals, and it was slower to meet with customers and get the feedback. So one thing I love with what's happening now is that potential in software, how you can connect more easily and you can make changes and fixes much more easily. Mm. Well, I'll tell you, we have something in common in that um, when I went to Ford Motor Company, <laughs> we were in uh, in dire straits and uh, quality was uh, not really high on the list. Um, it was in the uh, early 80s. And um, uh, we brought in Dr. Deming. And, um, you know, I knew a little bit about quality. But with him, as soon as he came in, as soon as uh, he came in and, and uh, gave us the word, as it were, um, it, it was an amazing transformation in my life. I, uh, I mean, he helped me move ahead in, 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 and I should mention this is at Ford. Um, he helped me move ahead at Ford simply because there was two groups. Uh, there was a group that said, you know, we've been focusing on production forever. Why should we even think of changing? And what's quality going to do for us, um, except uh, cost us more money and slow us down? <laughs> uh, when in actuality, it was exactly the reverse. Um, by the time I left in uh, 1988, uh, Ford was right on the verge of taking over General Motors. And the reason for that was because of the, the uh, focus on quality. And, and that focus actually on quality um, actually went beyond um just let's make it good as good as we can on the factory floor we actually actually our software that we use uh, uh the design profit stuff it has a quality aspect to it so we can predict quality and we were trying to do that when i was still at ford at the design phase how do we how do we figure out how to make the absolute best product when it hits the factory floor um, and know where our quality issues might be or, or where we're going to have to pay more attention uh, with, with, uh, with assembly or something like that. Um, is that still uh, going on at Ford? 
Yeah. So we, first of all, there's the, at the customer level and reacting to our customers and reacting as quickly as possible. That, that we've had some great success at recently. We learned a lot. And as we did the Mustang Mach-E, we had a, a system called FMV2, fully networked vehicle, which means we can interact with the customers very quickly. In fact, we used it during the design and development of the car. There was so much software in the car that you have a lot of bugs to find and burn down. And um, actually, we, div- we launched the car during COVID. So we, we had to. We ended up sending all the prototypes out to our engineers directly at their homes, and they could work on them there. And then we developed a system where they could uh, find a bug and then submit that bug with a recording, and it would collect all the data from the car and the CAN buses and so on and send it off to the development team. Often we would call the development team on a drive. By the time we parked, they were already working on it. So that find it there in software early is was a really amazing tool. We're just actually releasing that tool to the public now. And we did a small experiment. We added it to our cars. We, we left it one men, menu deep just to see uh, if how the input comes and how we can use it and it's been so successful we're pulling it to the front of the screen so there's that aspect that's the direct feedback from customers and and really fast reaction to it there's those i think you're also referring to how do you get this upstream into the design and into how we produce them and one real eye-opener for us is complexity and many of us have been working on complexity all our careers trying to keep it down but the fact is the more complex the product the more combinations you can buy the more you have to test and we had so many combinations in the past you can't test them all so you test the ones that you deem are the ones that pick up all the issues and things can fall through so one thing we learned on ev inspired by others i've got to say was to get that complexity down so we we launched mustang mach e with uh, i think 17 just 17 distinct vehicles. There's no options, just 17. Turns out the customers really love that because they can order that really quickly in just a few clicks. And it allowed us to really sign off every single version of those so that nothing can fall through between. But now we're seeing that if we take that all the way up to product development, it, it gives pays dividends in manufacturing as well. And, and that's what we learned. I've got to say, in our next gen, we have integrated manufacturing up front more in the design process. And we're seeing less fasteners, more, e- more easy, easily easy production, and, and those sort of things. And uh, your companies like yours have also been instrumental in showing us the value of that. And so we're in our, this generation we're working on now, we've completely changed our relationship with manufacturing as we develop them. That's excellent news. Um, when I was at Ford, um, we had uh, design teams and they did have, we did have uh, manufacturing people. We had people right from the floor, like hourly guys that uh, they were part of the design team. And that was what made us pretty successful with all that stuff. And, and quite frankly, everything boils down again to Dr. Deming. You know, he said his variation is reduced, quality will increase. Go to 17 variations versus millions. I mean, there are folks out there like BMW that have millions and millions of variables that, uh, that you can, you could never build the same car twice in a year, uh, with some of the, some of the, it it started there. And, and then uh, he also learned we, 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 we had the 17 and then we could see what people like or don't, which ones are selling more or less. Yeah. And we made specific adjustments based on what the customers have asked for. And, and we did it deliberately. So we had some derivatives. We tried our California special edition was supposed to be just for California. And it had certain options on it. But turns out the customers loved it. Uh, but it was missing heated seats because it was for California. And so we we were cha- we changed that one specific variant. And before we changed it, we could check all through the manufacturing and supply process to make sure no unintended effects. And we were able to make the change really quickly with with no impact to quality. So it also helped us hmm. to adjust to customers. And I think people like they don't want too much choice. They want vehicles tailored to them, and they want 
as much content as they can get. And yeah, we're finding that those, we call them configurations, a specific mm. set of configurations. We're finding it is making them happier. Happy customers mean uh, they're going to tell. We used to have a thing at Ford when I was still there. A um, 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 hundred happy customers might sell us a car. One unhappy customer will turn a hundred away. And that, I mean, I still use that uh, no matter where I am. So happy customers, we are a happy customer. As you know, we, we have uh, lightning and uh, I mean, that, that, that truck saved our bacon uh, big time. We, we had a whole bunch of people show up from around the world to do a workshop in Ann Arbor, or sorry, Ann Arbor, and Auburn Hills went out of, we ran out of power. There was no power here. There was no lights on in the factory. So we plugged in the, uh, the lightning and <laughs> here we are. I mean, it was like <laughs> phenomenal. I bet you, you sold a hundred cars right there. When, uh, when, when, when we plugged that thing in, uh, I, I know that two, two or three of our guys have got, well, it takes forever to get a lightning, but, uh, but they've got their vehicles. And, um, I know that the two or three folks that were North America, uh, based, from this from this customer they were pretty uh, pretty excited and these people the rest of them came from japan and china um south america and a lot from europe they were all really impressed it's not often you can say well we have no lights but and uh we're just <laughs> powering this through the truck i'm telling you it was just phenomenal but you know there's something cool. yeah there's something else though um, you, did you run the, uh, uh, the B and C and D, uh, uh, segments or whatever for Europe as well? Yes. Yeah, so in various jobs, uh, through my career, I, I, I worked on all the different segments of vehicles and commercials as well. They're really important when I was in Europe, transits, absolutely huge around the world, but even more so in Europe. Um, yeah. so yes, yeah, so that, so I went to each different class of vehicle, which, had different customers, but the one that was most challenging is B segment. So small cars like Fiesta yeah. Yeah. and those, I mean, it was almost, almost impossible to make money with huge investments. And, um, I had some amazing mentors along the way. And one of them was a, a person I would call more businessman than product development. And, uh, he really inspired us of how we could make at the time, the next generation of Fiesta. It was the point we just couldn't make any money. And we were saying, how can we justify billions of investment that makes no money ever? And he helped back then us to understand that we they, they have to be distinctive. They have to pull customer desire. And then the customer will then be willing to pay more for something they really like rather than a, a commodity, which is, I guess, obvious. But in that B-car similar, difficult to achieve. So that really taught us, and, and especially in the time in quality, it taught us hey, we really need to stand for something. Making a generic product is, is not really, is not doesn't have a, ha have a happy ending. And as we're moving into EVs, that has been a guiding light for us. So uh, when we started working on the, you know, in T-Medicine, what, where should we play and, and what will be distinct for Ford? We started that together with some amazing people, Ted Canis, you know, and, and others. And we, and we said, what should we make? And, and that input of we're not going to make a generic car or be try and be someone else. Um, we got to be you know, for us, Ford. And what do we bring to the table? So eventually it led to we're going to make a Mustang Mach-E and we're going to make a Transit, any Transit, we're going to make a Lightning, um, an F-150, because these are areas that Ford has have excelled in the past. And, you know, we want to make a more emotional electric car with the Mac E and that's what we worked set out to do. Uh, we didn't have a GT actually early on. And uh, once we realized, Hey, this needs to be a Mustang, we had to add the GT and that's why it launched a year later. I'm so pleased we did that one. The transit was more obvious and we used a lot of parts from the electric vehicles. And then of course the big one was the trucks and, and how to go about the trucks. But the input, what we gave was they must be distinctive. They must do things that you haven't had before and inspire customers. And so the mega power frunk and the bi-directional power, they were outcomes of that. We didn't know that they would be important for the truck. It was when we started the work of, hey, what can electric offer? 
there were a lot of things it could do, but which things do we think would inspire customers? And at the time, you know, we said, Let, let's get out of the office and go and see customers. And, and we went around the world and I, I said, actually, let's go to the toughest place you can think of for an electric truck. And, and we said, it was Texas, let's go to Texas where people really, you know, they're really serious about their trucks and let's see what they think and talk to them about the different things it could do and had no idea what to expect. And, and, and we, well, on the day we didn't get back what we expected either, but we tested, we tested a few things and the frunk went crazy. I've got more stories about that. And, and the bi-directional went crazy. They were the two things people said, Hey, that, that could, I don't have that today. That could be really yeah. useful to me. And they were the things actually that triggered the most interest afterwards, the fact it's faster than most sports cars and so on. Yeah, that comes, but they kind of expected that a little bit of electric. It was the, those new things that it brought to the table, they didn't expect. And they've, they've really attracted a lot of people to Ford that were, didn't buy Ford before. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the, uh, the big thing about the truck and, um, and the Mach-E uh, is that that was bold. Um, and, and that's an understatement to take the, the crown jewels of uh, a Ford motor company and saying, we're going to, we're going to make that happen. All the, I mean, I'm not the first one to say this, but all the other car companies, they decided they were going to put out like, um, you know, the Fiat 500E. I mean, I, I, it's, it's a nice little car, I guess, but at the end of the day, that's not a giant risk. And when you look at General Motors or even like BMW, uh, if they would have brought out something different than the, uh, than the, I, the, the BMW i3, if they would have brought out something that was dazzling, like for instance, I worked for, we, Monroe and Associates worked for BMW on the Mini. And um, the the choice for the mini was simple: do we get rid of it, or do we or do we start producing something different? And it was the same sort of conversation. If we're going to do something with this thing, it has to be a real mini, and it has to attract new customers because it wasn't even allowed in. There were so many countries you you couldn't bring the mini in, so that was a big deal. But and and quite frankly, it's the only thing that BMW kept. They scrapped everything else that they had with Rover. And the reason for that was because it had something unique. Ford going over and saying, okay, well, um, we're going to take the, um, basically the Mustang, which, I mean, that is the big vehicle. I, uh, everybody, when I was a kid, everybody aspired to get a, a Mustang. Uh, and, and, and the, and the F-150, holy mackerel, it, it doesn't get any bigger for rolling the bones than the two biggest, uh, the two biggest names that Ford has got. And, and everybody else decided, well, let's just put a nickel into the game. You can't win. Um, at least not for me anyway, you can't win unless you, uh, unless you uh, get in with both feet. And certainly Ford has done that. I mean, pfft. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm amazed that, uh, that that decision got me. How did that decision happen? Yeah, well, well um, so, so our leadership had, we tried to do some electric vehicles. I mean, you, you, know, you know, some of the ones that, that we worked on um, in the past and we were dabbling like others were and we have a good, a good business running and you've got a hundred year old company. So what do you do? And we had a lot of fits and starts and it didn't work. And our, our, and our leadership said, hey, this is not working at all. They could see how electric cars were, gonna, were going. And they said, hey, if we carry on like this, we, we're just going to keep dabbling. So we either need to buy an electric car company, or, or which then you need to integrate, or we need to try something different. So our leadership at the time, and Jim Farley was there, said, like, hey, we, let's try something. So they put a guy called uh, Ted Canis in for team edison who's an amazing business person and he's did transformations all over the world and said put together a team and try and work out where to play and how to win and so that's what happened and he called me and i joined the team and and, and some others a small a small team and they freed us of any uh, previous obligations that we had and said just go and look at the market talk to customers and work out where you think we should maybe play and so within a couple of weeks, we were going all around the world and talking to customers, of course, of customers of Tesla, 
and of other successful co companies in this space uh, in US, in all parts of US and Norway and um, China. And we, and we really just talked to customers and were thinking about what might we stand for. And along the way, we, sit, we saw what heavy bets some competitors had made and how they were great products. And we said, how are we going to, what will matter to people? And we realized pretty quickly that these are, these are technology products. And, and the, the EV revolution is massive, but the software revolution is equal, I think, bigger. And we realized that very quickly. And, for, and then we, we worked out which, which spaces would we like to play in. And it needs to be a space where Ford could be relevant. And so the midsize SUV was the first, the first one. And we did have a car in development, but it wasn't that car. And then, of course, the commercial space, and then, of course, Air Lightning. So they, they were the spaces we wanted to play in that perhaps Ford has a good relevance. And then the question was, how will we, how will we delight customers and what do we stand for? We're not going to copy somebody or we'll make something that they did. We've got to do something what's relevant. And we work, worked out pretty quickly, you know, if we need every, we need to be all in. I mean, you know, if, we get, if we're going to delight a customer, we can't go halfway. And we had a Ford Focus version two in the works but a ford focus version two was not going to cut it against such competent competition and, and we heard that from the customers who bought those cars so we said hey we need we need a different level of commitment and a different game and so that led us to what what if and what if it could be a mustang and then it, it quickly led to well it, it better it better be good enough it, what does it offer how why, why would you use such an amazing brand yeah, really. I for me, the history there's only two brands super relevant in that space in 50 years, and it's Porsche 911 and it's Mustang. So you don't just do that lightly, and you, you had to prove that it could be worth it. So we started to think about it. Then we started to try out some products. Then we realized the motors were not good enough. Then we realized the interior wasn't good enough. Then the tech wasn't good enough. And we went around the company and said, we need something better. And we worked out what can be done to work in an agile way. And we added a GT. And, and then we worked with the Mustang team about what makes a Mustang special. And they helped us make sure there was exciting elements to the car. And one of my favorites was engaging the, the performance team, Ford Performance. And they said, this thing's got a handle like a Mustang. And they put it in one of the most advanced racing simulators in the world long before we had product. It's so accurate that they can make small changes in the chassis of the vehicle and the person driving it can feel those like a real car. They, they use them for that car simulation as well. It's just amazing. And we put some pretty superstars in those and they tuned that car to feel like a Mustang. So it's got a rear bias, it yours when you uh, add some acceleration in a corner. And, and actually the subframes weren't stiff enough because the battery is so stiff and we had to change things and we ended up Long story short, we ended up redoing the whole subframes for the GT, and then we just rolled them back to all of the Mustangs. So why, why, why differentiate? So it's on all of Mackie now. So that was really fun. But it, we came to the conclusion it needed to be a Mustang, and then we we had we worked with some, you know Bill Ford in the company who's so passionate about Mustang about what it could be, and he he had come to that conclusion already. He said for the next generation. Mustang needs to be a wee car for my tribe. And then he, he completely supported us. So he, that's how we came to Mustang. And then it had to be good enough. So And, and then it, when we came to launch it, you saw that was a bold move. It was controversial. And we worked through, you know, it's a long story. We worked with lots of the uh, owners and clubs as we went into launch. Well, I'll tell you, uh, when it first came in the door, um, uh, I usually don't get a chance to, they want my first impressions when I see a car, when it comes in. So I walked around the corner and I looked at it and I said, oh my God. And I turned around and, and this is on camera. And I, I looked at it and I said, uh, oh, four doors. Can this possibly be a Mustang? And then I took it out and, uh, I don't, uh, I, I don't talk much about it because I wasn't that good at it, but I did race and I know a little bit about how to make a car move. And uh, I came back and I said, you know, that extra door is going to come in <laughs> handy. This thing is a Mustang. And then and that's why we decided to, I mean, we, I wanted to do the uh, BMW uh, ID4 
And um, we got that and I looked at it for about 20 minutes. And after all the squaring and everything, I said, screw it. We're not doing that. Get that Mustang. Can we buy that one? And uh, somehow, I don't know who we talked to, but somebody gave it, got it for us. Um, I think it was uh, a broker. So I'm not sure. But anyways, we got that, started tearing it down. And I was truly, truly impressed. The, the difference that Ford did uh, for me is that Ford put the A team on these designs and everybody else is putting the B team, you know, well, I don't want to take uh, you know, we're, we're making money with those uh, ice vehicles, go and get somebody else that, you know, one of the kids or whatever and put them on the, on the electric vehicles. And it shows, I mean, we do this every day. We tear cars apart every day. We can tell the difference between the maturity level of the designer or the manufacturer of, of a product. And when we got the Ford vehicles, it was the A-Team. There was no question about it. The the uh, the people that worked on that that product um, and put their heart and soul into it and had some uh, gray hair uh, in back of them, a little bit of gray hair anyway, to make sure that everything was gonna be running as just as perfectly as it could possibly be. So uh, I, I was told, <laughs> not to be dripping, but I can't help it. I, uh, I do like your, your vehicles. And, sure. um, and oh, so there we thank go. You. It is, we, um, I had a really amazing discussion with my boss, uh, Doug Field. I think you know him well. Um, yeah. and we were talking about each other's vehicles when he joined Ford. And I said, Hey, we looked at your car and you know, some of the things you did were just amazing. You know, we, we found the, the Octo valve, one of your favorites. He said that they put an octopus on it. And he said to me, do you know what? I, did, I didn't tell him to do that. The team did that. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. they were that passionate. And, and, he, and I said, you know, that kind of happened to us too. He said, yes, I know. I saw it. Electric ponies live here on the gearbox. Yeah. I said, I didn't yeah. tell him to do that either. He said, yeah, that was our team. And he said, do you know what? When we saw that um, torn down and I saw that on the car, I said, hey, that's a team who's got pride in it. And right. what they did, and they've done, right. they've done it all over the car. Actually, people haven't found all of them, but there's lots of yeah. ponies everywhere. And the the team just did that because they had pride in it. And so, you know, I love yeah. cars. We all love cars like that, right? Where yeah. they can put their heart and soul into it. And um, I, I a thing I loved about it also is that if everything wasn't perfect, when you go out with software, you pick it up quick. And, and mm. we started looking um, at social media because social media, when you got a, a car people like that, you see social media sites and we know about those on a lot of brands and they, it happened to us. So we had a Mackie forum and others and, and we watched it every day. And the, uh, the first weekend, the first car was delivered. We were watching that all day in the morning and a few days in somebody made a comment, Hey, my car's, not you know something's not right my battery went flat and we saw it and we thought that's technically impossible the system pumps the 12 volt battery how can it be can we contact them and they said hey we don't normally do that and like okay we gotta do that so they said let's contact them for a dealer we needed customers permission we did we contacted them. they were delighted and we sent engineers over we said can we have a look and we got to their garage and we worked out that their charger was faulty but our car did relied when we when it when it was plugged in it switched over to you know shore power if you like to the charger and therefore it stopped um, the twelve volt charge and then it was switched on and the battery went flat and that my word we didn't see it but we saw it on in the first three days so we went because we went down there we found it we then changed the software changed production within four or five days and over the air update all the other cars in the field so. Like we could never do anything like that before, so it never hit any customers. And, and we've been watching social media ever since. We watch it every morning, and we do, we customers are so passionate about it. You, they pick it up first. So for me, that has been a massive learning on this car. And then we, I'm really proud. The team updated the entire interface of the car, and really only one company's really done that before really well. That's Tesla, and they do it regularly and they update and, and 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 now we managed to do that so we switched on the the little control the um circular control which was always meant to be a kind of input device and we took feedback from customers and we we're able to enhance it so 
I, I'm now nowadays I'm so passionate about that how we can keep improving them every week, and and that's yeah. what we've got an always on team that that's what they do now. Well, speaking of social media, uh, I'm gonna. I'm going to jump through all these questions, get to the ones that I wanted. Um, I, I, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm sure you know that uh, social media kind of went nuts with the, um, with the uh, change to going to the um, North America charging uh, system. Um, I, I've been a big fan of this for a long time. And, uh, and quite frankly, I, uh, I like about a year ago, almost now when, uh, Jim, uh, Farley and, uh, and Doug, uh, presented us with, uh, with our new lightning, which the one that, that powered the factory. Uh, one of the things I said, is, when are you, when are you going to ditch the, um, <clears throat> the SAE, uh, charger and, and move to, um, the, uh, the Tesla charger. And, um, I don't know how long it's been in, uh, in uh you know discussion or whatever but uh but i'm telling you what when i heard about it i about peed my pants i put out a little note and said uh you know this is this is not just ford news or tesla news this is the news that basically says the end of ice is right here right now switching to to tesla's charging system i mean pfft, it doesn't get any better. And uh, this is going to be so big, it isn't even funny. Now, here's my, uh, here's my small dilemma. Uh, I, I'm not really a social media kind of guy, but, um, uh, but uh, I am on Twitter and um, there's about a half a million people that would like to see me interview Jim and, um, and Elon. So I've interviewed them separately, but I'm going to have to, I'm going to, after we're done, um, I'm probably going to try and see what I can do about getting something like that to happen because so many people are so interested in, this is like, this is the biggest thing ever. Uh, Tesla showing up with a car, the, uh, the, you know, that was a, that was a check mark in history. Ford coming with the, uh, the, the, the Mach-E and the, and, and the Lightning, especially the Lightning. Um, that was a big mark in history, <laughs> but, but moving to the point where everybody can get charged anytime they want, no matter how cold it is, no matter, uh, no matter, this is even bigger because that is the, as far as I was concerned, um, the biggest stumbling block for, um, for, uh, uh EVs was not range anxiety and all this other, pfft. oh, your car is going to go, the batteries are going to go dead and whatnot. I, I'd like to know more about um, um, what you think about the impact. This, like, for instance, how many more cars do you think Ford's going to sell than everybody else? Because really and truly, who's going to want that other? My wife hates that great honking thing. Uh, she just does not like to use the other the the other charger. Uh, at home, we have a Tesla charger with a little adapter. <laughs> here at the office the same thing for the for the lightning we don't we don't uh we don't use the other thing uh it just so what do you what do you think the uh, the market's going to hold how much how much more volume do you think ford's going to get than the rest of the oems well um we you know, we we're seeing that as the vehicle ranges went up and we saw People are much more comfortable when a vehicle has 300 miles. We saw that when we talked to them and lots and lots of people. So we, we aimed for that one with the vehicles. And then we're watching every day. We're listening every day. We see them struggle with the networks. We see the comments and it's starting to become a, a why not buy or a barrier to electric take up. And it could get complicated. And But that reliability where you go to a charger and it's not working, that, that that's it's terrible for a customer and we see it we feel it so we've been the team have been working for quite some time um to to say how might we improve that there are different ways you could go about that um and thanks to some amazing relationships between the people that work in our company um they've been working on that partnership for quite some time with, with elon um for uh, and when the next standard became open 
it became super interesting. And so they've been working on it for some time. The aim being to move from that chart, that range anxiety, which has been talked about for so long, to charging anxiety, exactly as you say. That would be the next barrier, charge anxiety. So once you know that you have a large network around you, that network is reliable, then all your anxiety goes away. And once you've done a few trips and you realize it works, uh, you just build it into your life. I, even if I go on a trip and it's going to take me longer to charge, I'm, and I've got a gas car, I'm going to take the electric anyway. The benefits are so much better, more comfortable, quieter. I just build it into my life. So you stop and you just go and get a coffee or, or a restroom break. You just you, you build it into your life and it works really well. But, um, so we were trying to work out what are the ways in which we can enhance that for customers. So I think this move adds about 12,500 chargers to our Blue, uh, uh, Blue Oval Network, um, 10,000 chargers, and now it's 22,500 chargers for people. Um, and you can move between them, and you can choose what you want. The customer will choose. And the, a lot of next chargers are installed in ideal locations where people want them in the corridors. They've been running for a long time, and they're running very reliably. So it's all about getting customers access to charging whenever they need it and they can choose and that's what it's about and and this was we think the best way of doing that i i think it could have been a barrier or w would be a barrier to some people to buy a car you know that if you're not on that standard personally and so we we recognize that too and so we wanted to support a standard that we think is a great standard and is working very reliably and so um yeah and but Kudos to our, our, our teams who who have made those partnerships and made that happen. Well, more than kudos, like I said, that that news uh, was the watershed. As far as I'm concerned, everything was uh, pretty murky. Um, and I, you know, I've been into uh, EVs uh, since about 20. Well, I was working with the Chinese on EVs um, in uh, 2014 or 15, um, but uh, when I came and started talking to the general public, especially the larger newspapers and, and magazines who never talk to me anymore. But, uh, but at that time I was saying, Hey, you know what, by 2030, it's going to be 50, 50. And, um, and I was worried that that was not going to be happening until that announcement now. So I, I don't, you, you probably don't know this, but Corey and I, my president and I took a trip. We went from Detroit to Los Angeles, Los Angeles to San Diego, San Diego to Eugene, Oregon. And then Elon said, Hey, you want to interview? And, uh, but I'm in, uh, Brownsville, Texas. That's the farthest place you can go on and, and still be on the continental U S. And, uh, we went right from Oregon all the way straight through the middle of the country went and seen him, did the interview back to Detroit. That was 8,500 miles, eight, and we did it in 11 days. People say, oh, well, I, I, I can't get to where I want to get to fast enough. Or the 11 days. I'd like to see anybody try and do that um, on a regular basis. And we never had a problem. And the reason for that was because of the Tesla chargers. I I think they're... Uh, they're um, I don't know. Their coverage is like phenomenal. When we went through the desert, <laughs> you know, there's nothing. I mean, they don't even tumbleweed. There's nothing in this. I, I'd never been through the center of the United States before. And that once is enough. So, uh, but, you know, we're getting close and then the little thing pops up on the screen while your charger, your supercharger is on the way. We're conditioning the battery. It comes on automatically. We're conditioning the battery so that you can pull in and charge up. All these things now can be transferred to my lightning and uh and my maki and you know what <sighs> i'm a happy guy i mean this is this is easy peasy this is the thing that's missing and all these i have no idea how many billions of dollars went down the drain for uh, the other systems but uh, uh uh there's there's no way if i was uh the president of the united states i wouldn't have given anybody a nickel except for tesla because the rest of them they don't work. I mean, all you got to do is uh, is uh, take a look at some of the blogs out there, and uh, especially in the winter time, 
uh, out of spec. <laughs> that what's uh, what's out of spec's name? Kyle. 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 This guy. Oh, Connor. Yeah. Yeah. Holy mackerel! He nailed it, and and that is the truth. It is the truth. And if you want to really have a bad experience, just listen to my wife trying to hook up uh, to to a, a charger using the lightning in the middle of a blizzard and freezing ass cold. That. That was uh, that was a bad night for. I was like four or five glasses of scotch. Um, I'm telling you, it was tough. So. <laughs> yeah, we um, so Kyle and their team there and uh, inside EVs. You know, we yeah. they're really experienced in this field as well. And we listen mm. to that. I, I you know I know the guys there, and we we listen to what they're saying. And they've been saying it for a while. Right. You know, the network's not what it needs to be, and um, it's becoming an issue for people. And so we, we hear those and we feel those from customers. The customers find me and, um, and, they, and they contact me and they tell me about their experiences. And, and mm. some of them, you know, when you, if you get to a charger and it's not working and you're low on energy and you have your family with you and you have to be somewhere, oh, it's very yeah. harrowing. And if you have it makes you nervous. To, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have to switch to a level two and sit there for four hours. It's, it's really harrowing for people. Yeah. So it, it, you've got to be right. They've got to be working. You got to know before you go there, and ideally know if they're full before, so you know what. Oh, but but that, that's the thing. The other the other chargers know before you go. It says, "Oh yeah, I'm working," and it says it right on the. But then you plug it in. Oh, sorry, I I, I, I lied to you. And not only that, uh, like I say, I don't want to go into the big story with my my wife Susan, but I'll tell you, one, two, three, and she's pulling the car out and moving it over and moving it over and moving it over, and they were all dead. None of them worked. None of them. So uh, uh, now, um, I I'm, let me ask you another question. Who do you think might be next? Uh, the next oh. OEM to swap. <laughs> oh, I can't switch. comment on that. So I'm I'm, I'm sure it spurred some discussion. And uh, you, know, <laughs> you got to be kidding me! <laughs> uh, I was positive there was going to be either uh, a run on laser blades for uh, for people slicing their wrists or jumping out of buildings. I. Uh, I, I'm just, <laughs> that's, that's part of that uh, English humor thing. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, there's plenty of spurring going on, I'm sure. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I won't comment on others. They, I'm sure they're thinking about you know, their position on these. Um, but And it, it could well uh, enc encourage others to go the same way. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really all for one standard. We've all lived, you know, Betamax and VHS and all those yeah. things. And different standards. It doesn't doesn't help the industry, right? If you know, it doesn't. You know, we, everybody just wants it to work, and it yeah. doesn't need to be a differentiator. Differentiator. So, you know, so I, you know, got to hand it to uh, everybody involved here for making it work, um, and for you know, partnering together. I I I learned along the way. A very, there's a Silicon Valley type attitude on things about we're doing our own thing. You're welcome to join in with us and. Yeah. Or be part of that and help each other. There's a little bit of that, and that happens in some areas. We learned a bit of that, um, and that's it's good for everyone. And you know, if we've learned something, we'll share it with you, and you you build it to the next level, and you share it back again, and those sort of things. So that yeah. that whole software mentality is a little bit like that. And um, we have a lot of people in our company in Model E now who have experience uh, from the different from software driven. Let's say they're bringing another level of learning and understanding into our company and we're and that's being put together with longer term vehicle oem type people and get the best out of both that's what we're yeah. we're really looking to do and i'm so excited about what they bring for software and and, and a mentality it's a mentality change as well we're trying to be really open-minded and take on new ideas and and go with it it's, it's super exciting it's like one of the most exciting times ever well, in, in the automotive industry yeah. really well, this is the only time in my life I wished I was younger. I uh, <laughs> looking forward to getting old and uh, you know uh, retiring or something. But now, um, this—I mean, I've been on the planet for seventy-three years, and I have never really experienced anything that uh, that's got me, you know, out of bed every morning uh, more enthusiastically than than the electric uh, electrification of the automobile. And 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 quite frankly, I. I mean, our fan base has a lot of old guys, especially old, uh, old, um, old car guys. And 
it's amazing the uh, the responses that I get back from these folks. Everybody is 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 looking at this as like, oh, that this is finally, you know, we're just around the corner. Where's George Jetson when you need him? That kind of thing. <laughs> that that kind of stuff is is in fact next generation of uh, of transportation. I think is going to be um, electric VTOLs. But before we get to electric VTOLs, let me get to something else that I'm very interested in hearing about. Um, so Elon uh, announced uh, that he's going to 48 volts uh, for, you know, the low voltage stuff and, um, and 900 volts for um, the heavy duty charging. Where can you comment at all on where Ford is going to go? Because yeah, yeah, 48 volts is a big deal. I, I, when I was at Ford, I was pushing 48 volts. Um, uh, I mean, we couldn't get it to happen because they said, well, there's the supply community basically has you by the throat. You, they won't, they aren't going to do anything unless there's bazillions of these things involved. So, Where's Ford on the 48 volt, 900 volt thing? Yeah, so so the the high voltage, uh, eight eight plus volts because they're all they're all floating up somewhere above seven. Mm. Yeah, 800 is somewhere above yeah. seven, and so they will float around here. Uh, this high voltage architecture is it, it definitely we're leaning into because it enables high speed charge right, right. In, in really reduced times with thinner cables and and more efficient, right. and so. The, this one's we're definitely leaning into these in our next generation products. We're looking for those, so that's a given. And that was part of the discussion also with the network, the NACs, and what NACs can support. And so the V4s will fully support those voltages as well. And that was an important part of it. So, and the plug system is going to be capable of doing that. So, high voltage is really going to be exciting. Our next gen products. We started. We, we talked about our, our three row product coming. And it, what we, we've mentioned, you know, it's f super efficient, 350 miles, and but also at high speed. So at the speeds people want to drive, it will do over 300 miles. And then it will fill up again in 10 minutes, 150 miles. And the, the high voltage is what supports that. And that makes adoption easier for people to understand. Uh, for the, a lot of people think who only drove gas, only ever drove gas, that they have to fill the car in five minutes. They they've forgotten that they go to the gas station every week and it takes them 15 minutes and they all they keep focusing on when I'm on this trip a little bit more rarely, it takes too long. So if we can get that time down, it does make it easier for them to understand. Once they own it, as you commented, they realize it's really not an issue. You just build it into your life and you need a rest break and every three hours anyway. And it, it really isn't the problem people think it is, but but it, the lower we get that time, the more accessible it makes. So we're fully into those. You're, there's all, the whole 48 volt, high voltage, low of the, higher voltage of the low low voltage circuit is an interesting subject. And along the way, there's getting out of AGM batteries, glass mat, and those batteries into lithiums, and ultimately getting out of lithiums into the main battery and DC to DC converters. This whole subject, is, that's not a nice system at the moment. You're relying on that battery too much. And the, and the battery's got a limited size and a limited life, and you rely on it for OTAs and things like that. So we're all trying to get out of that 12-volt battery in, in one way or another, and there are different steps along the way. As soon as you move out of 12 volts, as you say, every part that runs on 12 volt now needs to be an all-new part, which is maybe not an industry standard part. So raising from the bulbs to the relays to the switches to the controls, everything has to change. So that's a change you want to make deliberately and at the right time. So we're working on all, so all sorts of things, ranging from 12 and lithiums and DC to DC, you know, to, to all others. So we haven't got anything to announce on it just yet, um, but you, you know, they're all things we're, we're, we're considering as well. Mm. Well, that would, to me would be uh, the next big, um, the next big announcement. Um, I'd, I'd really like to see uh, a movement there because again, when I was with, uh, Ford at engine division, <laughs> we would have loved to have seen 48 volts for a lot of different reasons, but that was then, this is now. So, but there's, there's something else when we're talking about, um, you know, Ford motor company, we've been talking basically about the, the pickups and the, and the, uh, and the general transportation kind of issues, but 
What about uh, what about Super Duty? Um, where are you there? Um, I, I, there was a quote here from Jim Farley uh, to J Jalopnik. If you're pulling 10,000 pounds in an electric trunk, it's probably not the right solution. And 95% of our customers tow more than 10,000 pounds. This is for the Super Duty. Um, Jim also said this is a, a really important segment for our country and it probably <clears throat> will go to hydrogen fuel cells before it goes pure electric. Um, any uh, any comments on that? Because like right now we're working on uh, aircraft with uh, fuel cells, and uh, of course Nikola um, is trying to move in that direction. Um, where where would Ford be uh, on uh, on the fuel cell? Uh, or let me rephrase that: Where's Super Duty heading? I guess it'd be yeah. So, way. so um, we, want, we no, no one knows the customers better than the Ford Pro team. They're so, so close with their customers every single day. And and the and the people who run those companies that upfit them. I mean, nearly every Super Duty is upfitted and or every Super Duty is upfitted. So so they they know those companies so well. So they know what people do with them every day. And it's really important that the vehicle will perform to do what they want it to do. So it truth is it pure EV at the moment will not do a hundred percent of use cases. And that's why it's a good idea to have a, a series of products. So we, we've got gas and we've got hybrids and we've got EVs. And the line will also blur between what's an EV and what's a hybrid and what's a gas. Um, so that, that's got an infinite line as well when you start bringing things like e-revs in, you know, range extenders and so on. So the, all of them are there. So I would say uh, if we start with Lightning, so L Lightning meets a larger proportion of customers need than maybe even we realized. We, we we listened a little bit too much to some detractors at the beginning and we put down a lower volume than we should have. We realized it quickly and then we worked to raise it. And in fact, we had to build a whole new factory over the top of the existing one because we didn't want to stop the existing one just as we're launching. So that's happening now and you see we're going up to 150,000. So we made a mistake there. We didn't call it enough because it turns out it does meet more people's needs than some people thought, because a lot of people will charge, will 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 tow occasionally, and, and, and towing range down just like a gas does, can bring it down by half in in heavy heavy circumstances and 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 trailers that have a lot of air resistance. Um, but it actually meets really a lot of people's needs. And then you ask about charge anxiety and can you pull three charges and charge when you've got a trailer on the back? Important as well. But it actually meets a lot of people's needs, but not everybody. And then you come to Super Duty, where people are regularly pulling larger loads. They're not always pulling them hundreds and hundreds of miles, though. So a Super Duty again is probably you're going to look. You're going to need a range of solutions, um, ranging from gas to some level of hybrid to pure EV. There's also a lot of regulations coming in that say that pure zero emission vehicles are required in a lot of places at a lot of high percentages. So actually some of the use cases of Super Duty can be met by EV. Things that companies do regularly every day, there's a known route, they have a charger at their depot, they manage the charging properly and, and, and they don't go that far actually. That things like trucks that repair our electric infrastructure or you know, work trucks and, and say service trucks. These don't go very far actually and they have more than enough energy for the day, and they really want an onboard generator as well. So there are use cases, but it's not all of them. And so we're, we're looking at those from a use case base because one thing's for sure, they better well deliver, and they better deliver for whatever that customer wants. So we learned a lot on Lightning. It pulled new people we never expected, who never had a truck. It would see it as a lifestyle vehicle. And then it also pulled work trucks, and it's working really well in fleet now. We have two versions, 230 and 320 miles, 240, and they're both doing really well. And if you've got a fleet and you know the use case, if you buy one kilowatt more than you need, that's a waste and you're dragging it around with you. So that that's really exciting. And LFP technology is becoming very exciting because it's low cost, long life, full charge every day, and it's a specific miles, a little bit more than our short range vehicles. So that's very promising as well. So, so use case based is really important. So I, I, we can see use case for an, a pure EV super duty, but it's not all of them. Um, and we're working with our customers now to make sure 
it would do everything they want it to do with the upfits. The upfits are super important as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I went to, we were in Long Beach uh, the other day um, with the uh, electronic show and, um, and uh, well, not the other day. It was like two weeks ago, something like that. Anyhow. Um, and when, uh, when we were there, um, I got a chance to talk to quite a, a lot of people and at that show, um, I was told now somebody sent me some pictures as well about the, uh, Nikola trucks that are sitting, you know, basically in the line, um, at, uh, at Long Beach, the docks at Long Beach and the docks at, um, at Oxnard. And, uh, the pictures are really quite dramatic. You see all these diesel trucks spewing because they're waiting, right? That's mostly what you do at the docks is wait. And they're spewing out all this uh, smoke and whatnot, because most of them are, when you get to that stage, uh, these, these trucks are not uh, the best on the planet. Anyways, they're spewing all this stuff. And then you see three black trucks, which are the ones from Nikola, nothing. And the inside, those guys are inside. They're, they're sitting. The reason the trucks are running is because you'll die. It's, it's hotter and blazes there. So you have to have the air conditioner on the air conditioner needs to have the, have the engine on. And so it's, it's terribly inefficient. And yet there they are, you know, uh, doing their thing. I think this is where they're going to probably want to see, um, bigger trucks class six to six to 10 or six to eight rather I should say that that's, that's probably where they're going to want to see uh, a change first is on the docks to zero emission because there just really isn't any, I don't need, I'm not going to have range anxiety there um, because these guys are just going to unload from the ships, take it to another warehouse and they've got time to charge and, and move back and do it again. So uh, that might be one of the spots there that uh, maybe you could try out. Yeah. There's, like you say, specific use case and um, like all new technologies and companies are nervous to move into them. So the, that's why it takes a lot of work with them. For example, we launched the e-transit last year and we showed customers what it can do for them. But they're nervous though. So we, we talked to the CEO of the company and the, and the fleet buyer because both of them have to believe in it and buy into it. And it turns out a super important part of it, no surprise, is the charging and that you need de depot charging the, to work to make the business work. And then you need to work out how you're going to do that. And also that gets into what service is available to that business, because if you have to upgrade the service, then it's really expensive. And so we've got a group that are helping people to do that. In fact, we bought a company electrify to help with that. It's so, it's so difficult. We pulled those, we brought that company and those skills in to help yeah. work out for customers, what you can do, because frankly, you can put less in and use it optimally and switch between the trucks and make sure you charge the ones that need it, or you can put much more in just so you've got it spare. But if you don't have the feed to the factory, it costs a fortune. So yeah. and the customers that are using it are seeing mass and they can undercut their competitors. I mean, they can sell at below the competitor's cost in some businesses. I mean, it could wipe out their competitors um, if you get it right. And they also tell me if you get it wrong with the charging, you can be more expensive than diesel. So it's really important. Yeah, yeah, got, yeah. Yeah. And that's complicated. And customers, you can imagine they're fearful to step into it. So we're having to work with them on that. But once they once they once it starts working for their business, then of course, they really they become all in and they want more and more. So and we haven't had the we haven't had the products available for them. We've been sold out for all of them since. But all of them now this year are coming up with uh, multiples higher volume. So uh, we mm. should we should actually have the vehicles available. And like now we we have we we have now lightnings are becoming available finally after yeah. we, you know yeah. so people can order them now and and Mackie as well Mackie's production's coming up now uh, many multiples we had before so at least we can now have products there and and available for customers quickly um and i'm looking forward to that well once you switch completely to uh, the north american charge system i believe that um <clears throat> you're going to need to either swap plants <laughs> 
with the F-150 or twin the, uh, the Mach-E or you're, you're going to, I think you're going to see a tremendous increase in the amount of sales. I really do. Because there are people who, I don't know, they, maybe they don't like Elon Musk or something, but, uh, but they, uh, they want, they want to buy something else. And, uh, the something else in this case, there's only really one choice. So, uh, it looks to me like you're going to be doing, uh, really quite well. Um, I, I guess that, uh, um, according to, uh, Eric here, <laughs> um, I've yammered on too much, but, uh, but I, I am really, really excited for Ford. Um, uh, it is my old alma mater. I, uh, I make no, no secret about the fact that, you know, we, uh, we've been promoting North American products and that's it. Tesla, Tesla and, and Ford are the only two car companies that I know of that haven't got bankrupt or been bought by somebody else or what have you. So, um, I, I wish you all the well, all, all the best in the world. And, um, hopefully, uh, <laughs> hopefully I'll get a chance to interview, uh, Elon Musk and, um, and Jim Farley, uh, in the future and make about a half a million people stop sending me notes. <laughs> I'll, so, I'll be very excited and look forward yeah. to that. Thank you so much for the, taking Alrighty. the time today. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Yep. Have a great day. Bye.